Of course I love Vietnamese food. This is pho pizza. Is this the most dangerous meal in Vietnam? This has been a fun day. <laughs> and of course, eating some new incredible food. This stuff is good. Kind of strange looking and super bitter, but it's really delicious once you learn how to cook. And this is Chad Kubinoff. I'm a chef living in Vietnam. These captivating cooking videos about Vietnamese cuisine have garnered millions of likes and comments on social media. They are made by Chad Kubanov, an American chef who fell in love with Vietnamese food. To Chad Kubanov, an American chef from Philadelphia, Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City specifically is one of the best foodie destinations in the world. And Chad is obsessed with trying new cooking recipes, new ingredients, new food. And to him, it is in Vietnam that he found himself a better cook. So how is it being a foreign chef in Vietnam and why in Vietnam that he found the vision for his art of cooking? We have Chad here in our studio based in Ho Chi Minh City to answer all of that. Welcome, Chad. Welcome, Chad, to uh, Talk <laughs> Vietnam. Xin chào. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. You have a, sh a T-shirt uh, with uh, what's in it? It's got the table, the stools. My mm -hmm. name is the iconic uh, symbol <laughs> of street food to me. OK, so the plastic stool, the table, yeah. is uh, something that impressed you very much. I love it. I just love it. I think it's super comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about it that feels so casual and, I don't know, just relaxing and comforting to me. I love it so much. Okay. I love the simplicity of it. Okay, so Chad, um, I know you and probably um, many of the viewers out there know you on TikTok mm -hmm. and YouTube, yeah. Instagram, yeah. and all of the everywhere. social platforms everywhere. Yeah. yeah, before we have the chance to try your food. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you are doing very well on social um, media platforms. I'm trying. Right? Things are going well so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell me more about that. Uh, 25.7 million views, a million likes, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, and uh, almost 700,000 uh, subscribers. Yeah, followers, uh, yeah, on followers. TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like your content featuring Vietnamese food uh, is doing very well. Yeah. 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 Explain that to me. Why are you <laughs> doing that? And I was like, well, I know about Vietnamese food. Let me start sharing that. Let me share what I know. And uh, I thought it would help other cooks learn. Um, for me as a chef, I always want to teach cooks. That's my first instinct is to, like you train younger cooks for them to become better, for them to become chefs. Okay, so sharing is the initial yeah. attention. You know, um, Anthony Bourdain, yep. he also had a, an episode in his uh, uh, Parts Unknown sure. featuring uh, Bún Bò Huế. Sure. Yeah, and he's, uh, he was eating uh, on a plastic stool, uh, also uh, eating Bún Bò Huế. Yep. Yeah, so, so I find it like a coincidence here. Um, was Anthony Bourdain uh, an inspiration for, for you? Sure, for sure. Uh, I remember when I was probably about 18, I was working in New York City, mm -hmm. and that's when I first started seeing uh, Bourdain and then saw him go to Vietnam, and that was very exciting to me and intriguing to me of, mm -hmm. uh, I want to go there. Let me go check that out. So he definitely not only inspired myself, but inspired many. Um, to explore, to be open-minded, and, and to look at Vietnam as a new place to check out or a new cuisine that, that is worth exploring and, mm. and is interesting. How old were you? I think I was 18. 18. Yeah. So at that uh, you know, very early young yeah. age, yeah. Uh, and after watching that episode of Anthony Bourdain, yeah. um, and then what came into your mind? I knew I wanted to eat street food. Mm. That's the, the, I was like, I want to eat street food. That's it. So uh, I had that impression. And I just started deciding that that's what I was going to do. I was going to eat street food in Vietnam. And I just kind of kept telling people I was going to do that and kept putting that in my mindset. And eventually it happened. The Vietnamese culinary component gradually grew in Chad Kubanov and inspired him to combine Vietnamese spices with the Western dishes. Creating the fusion of pho and pizza is among his attempts at doing this so. This is pho pizza. 
but I want to try to make a pho pizza. Is that something I can do? I will try it. Yeah. <laughs> Today, our goal is to learn how to make a great pizza and try to put pho on it. Obviously, I can't just put a bowl of soup on a pizza, but it's not that easy. Better? Oh, no. I know he's critical, but I think this looks really good. I think it looks good. It's not a complete disaster. <laughs> well, that one's a disaster. Follow me to figure out how this Vietnamese Italian fusion will work. What do you think about that? I think you got all the flavors. Chad also recreates the authentic taste of Vietnamese salads, vermicelli, and mixed pho using local ingredients. The love for Vietnamese food has eternally altered Chad Kupanov's culinary perspective and helped him quickly learn the Vietnamese language by communicating with market vendors. Fascinated by Vietnamese cuisine, Chad has cooked many dishes with bold variations in taste and visual appeal, which stun his followers and himself. So now going back to Vietnamese cuisine, um, what's, what's about Vietnamese cuisine that you often choose to tell first to visitors to Vietnam? Um, I think it's just good for people to know that the food is not naturally spicy, mm -hmm. um, and most dishes aren't naturally aggressive in seasoning. You season it at the table. So it's, it's very suited for everyone's palate. If you don't like spicy, don't put chili in it. If you like so does that mean that people think the Vietnamese food are spicy? Yes. Oh. I think sometimes. Some people do. Some people just think Vietnamese, Asian, Asian is spicy. Okay, Vietnamese food is spicy. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little bit of fear. It's close to Thailand. Some people don't really know the difference, so they just think it's similar. Mm. And really, it's uh, even though things are delicious, when they come to you, they're not explosively seasoned. And you can do it as much as you want at the table. So I think that's very cool about Vietnamese cuisine. It's very flexible. Right. Everyone, you can enjoy it the way that you like it. So I think that's a good thing that foreigners can be aware of and may not necessarily be aware of. Other good things to know is that it's like mostly naturally gluten-free. So for all these people who are gluten intolerant, most of the dishes are gluten-free. Um, yeah, and, that, and also that uh, I try to help people to be more open-minded about fish sauce mm. because people are terrified right away and uh, they don't realize how delicate and balanced it can be. Yeah. So I think fish sauce will probably, in the next 10 years, will really have its time to shine and people will start appreciating it. Right, so besides fish sauce, we also have Shrimp paste. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, That's a little different. It's a little, <laughs> little, little. Uh, I would never call that delicate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for you, shrimp paste is still uh, a challenge. I love it. You love oh, it. I love it. I just, I don't think, I don't know any dish mm. that exists in the cuisine right now where where mantom is is delicate or soft. Mm -hmm. It's always there. It's mm. always a punch. I'm sure before I've worked with, I've tried to make like barbecue sauce mm -hmm. with a little bit of mom tom inside to sneak it in. Yeah. And that works out. Yeah. But in a naturally traditional Vietnamese dish, it's always front and center. You, right. you, if you don't like it, you won't like it. If yeah. you do, you'll love it. Uh, working as a cook, you need to also explore other cuisine to kind of enrich your experiments. It definitely helps you. As a cook yeah. and maybe a potential chef in yeah. the future. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, as, as a young cook, you try to... To me, if you're, I don't want to say that, if you're smart or something, you try to broaden your horizon so you can get different uh, ideas, different mm -hmm. perspectives. So I learned French cuisine in New York City, and then I moved to Chicago and I learned like modern cuisine. I think it was from watching Bourdain. I don't, I don't know where the moment of inspiration came, but I realized that there's all these techniques in Asia mm. that us as Western cooks don't know about that already produce a new texture. Right. So if I could learn those new techniques, I can implement them into my own personal cuisine and I'd have a whole new tool set, a whole new arsenal of how to cook better, how to create textures. Right. Yep. I have a question um, <clears throat> because usually um, as a young cook yeah. uh, who wants to become a chef, yeah. usually after getting trained in, in, in cooking school yeah. um, and then you should work for like big uh, kitchen, yeah. right? And yeah. uh, like five star dining yeah. or Michelin, you know, yeah. restaurant. But you chose kind of the opposite approach, right? From the moment you landed in, 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 in Ho Chi Minh City, yes. right? Yes. How did you feel? Wild. That very, wild. 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 Okay. I, I haven't thought about that day in a long time. You bring up emotion. Wild. This is a crazy place. Getting off the airport, it was so hot. That Com was in what year? 2008, 
2008. Okay. 2008. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was so hot. I couldn't believe how hot it was and how sweaty I was. You know, people say that first impression is very important. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so your first impression obviously was quite strong. Quite strong. Quite strong. Quite. Once we get through the airport, once the airport situation's <laughs> done, then like yes, quite out. strong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It hits you. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, what? What next? Um, during that, after that time period? Yeah, after, after that time uh, period. I worked as a chef at a fine dining restaurant in District 1. So I did that for a few years. I just didn't have the language skills, so I couldn't communicate with the staff. Mm -hmm. So that was extremely difficult. So there was a lot of hand signaling. <laughs> I, learned about, uh, I learned how to say salt and fast and sugar. My, my uh, highest excitement, or what I wanted to do the most, was just taste. I just wanted, I, I was here to taste. That's all I wanted to do. So luckily for me, uh, uh, during the restaurant shift or during my job, there was two older women who did prep work, mm -hmm. and they also would cook the staff meal. So I was able to taste the normal home-cooked family meal, just everything that you would eat with rice. Right. So um, I, I was able to taste these home family meals, which helped me develop my palate and helped mm -hmm. me to develop the understand how flavors come together in this cuisine. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, on my days off or any time off, I would just be on the street just trying to eat. So I had the home-cooked meals, and then I also had like the street meals or what you would go out and eat with. So I, had a, um, I was lucky enough to get a, a, a broad range of flavors and taste in a short amount of time. I see. So in the daytime, you worked in a fine dining restaurant. Yes. And in the evening, yes. you were on your scooter. Yes. Yeah, riding yes. around. Just looking. Just and, looking. And it's so, at first when I got here, everything was new. So it didn't, I didn't have to drive far. I just saw something I've never seen before. Let's go try that. You know, now it's a lot harder for me to find something new. Mm -hmm. But initially, uh, everything was new. So it was just so exciting. Everything was exciting. Yeah, but, si but Ho Chi Minh City is so vast. Ho Chi Minh City is huge. And there are so many like, small alleys and roads. Yes. And so there's always somebody new opening something. So that you'll, you'll never try it all. And that's, that's definitely one of the exciting parts about it. Born and raised in the U.S., Chad Kupanov has a keen interest in traveling and cooking. In 2008, Chad Kupanov first arrived in Ho Chi Minh City at the age of 21. He was immediately smitten with this place due to the friendly locals, especially the flavorful Vietnamese cuisine. In 2011, Chad Kupanov returned to the U.S. with his family. However, the yearning and nostalgia for Vietnamese food still followed him around. He finally migrated to Vietnam and settled in Ho Chi Minh City after the COVID-19 pandemic. He became a culinary content creator, specializing in reviewing street food stalls. He also replicates hundreds of Vietnamese delectable dishes and introduces them to viewers around the world. On his social media account, with more than 700,000 followers and over 26 million likes, Chad Kubanov treats its viewers to home-cooked Vietnamese dishes. This new job satisfies Chad's devotion to Vietnamese food. It earns him a lot of love from many, including foreigners and overseas Vietnamese. He has promoted Vietnamese culture by sharing his exciting culinary adventure. It. You just said that you're all about street food. Yeah, I love it. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So, because you think it's real rather it's, than a presentation? It's of, just the base. It's, yeah. it's, how, it's, it's how the people have evolved to put flavors together. This is the representation of it. The street or the family meal is the representation of how these people put flavors together. And fine dining is just a way to look at those flavors and present them in a new way. See street food and family as the core of the cuisine and fine dining as an expression or the highest expression of the cuisine. Mm. And I had the desire to uh, explore more of Vietnam because all I saw at that point was Ho Chi Minh City. Mm. So I had a goal that I'm going to drive to Hanoi. That was my goal. I was like, I'm just going to do it. So I From had down to... down south to up north. Yes. Yeah. And I had, uh, I had to convince my girlfriend very hard to mm. do this. She did not want to do this at all. But I told her I'm doing it, so okay. she decided to come. So I, we drove from Ho Chi Minh City uh, up to Hanoi. We did, it took us about three months, and we kind of zigzagged the whole way up. Mm. And I wanted to take as long as I could, and I wanted to, I wanted to see the country. I think for me, like I, I spent much more time central and south. Mm -hmm. North is not, I haven't spent much time in. Right. So when I, when, I, when I tasted food up in the north, it was very intriguing to me how it's not, it's very different in cuisine. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not as sour, it's not as fermented. 
it's saltier. There's a lot more dill used, of which I liked all that. So mm -hmm. it was, it, it, al it almost feels like two different things. Right. It really does feel like two different yeah. things. So. Talking about uh, different uh, tastes of yeah. different uh, local cuisines in Vietnam, uh, after that trip, then something must have happened, right? Because at that time you thought that you, you would leave, but then you, yeah, what kept you? Um, I don't know. I still liked it. I didn't <laughs> want to leave yet. Yeah. I still You're enjoyed it. You're not done it. with it yet. No, I'm not okay. done with it. And I, I didn't know what I was doing at mm -hmm. that time. I still didn't know what I was doing, but I, I, I had a, a broader understanding of the cuisine, so that was exciting. Okay. And then my brother came to visit, and uh, we took him out on a tour. I just took him around the city. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you should do this. You should do this for people. You should take people out, because Ho Chi Minh City is a hard city if you don't speak Vietnamese. So we started, we opened a tour company, mm -hmm. um, taking people out to eat street food. Right. Um, so that was like the next step. And, uh, through that, I, I knew that I knew where good food was in Ho Chi Minh City, and I wasn't, I thought that the food that people were trying on tours wasn't um, what I would want to try. Mm -hmm. I knew that people wanted to like try the real local street food, and, and I had a way to bring people there and also explain it to them in a way that they could understand and feel comfortable. Right. Um, so through that time, I just got, that time, like my job at that point was just go drive around and find good food. And then after that uh, food tour, uh, what happened? After that, we did that for seven years. This is the company. They're still alive today. We sold that, okay. um, and it's still in operation today. So we moved back to America. I opened a restaurant in Philadelphia. So what are the best seller dishes? Caramelized pork banh mi. Oh, so yeah. banh mi. Yeah, banh mi yeah. is, is for sure. And, and this caramelized pork, so we did a, like a pork that was heavily marinated with a lot of fish sauce and a lot of sugar. It was mm. very, very sweet. Very, very rich, and when you grilled it, it got like crispy because there's so much sugar on it. It's amazing, super good, <laughs> super good. Yeah. Um, so people love that. Absolutely, they love that. So we would do that, and we would do like uh, noodle bowls, like bun, uh, like bun tien nung, something like that, mm. and that was really popular. And then I started doing uh, making bun bao hui, but for the the Viet Q that were there, or the second gen generation Vietnamese, they were pumped. They mm. were so happy because I did try to make that as authentic as possible. Mm. I really bun bao hui is an important dish to me. And I did not want to make anything that was like similar. I wanted right. to make the dish. This okay. is the dish. I like Saigon style bumba, mm. and so I had to make it that way. But How it, did you get all of the ingredients? It's very expensive. Uh, That's the problem. Okay. So I had to sell that dish for sixteen dollars. Okay. Yeah, a, a many years ago. So that, at yeah. that time, that was an expensive bowl, but it was a good bowl. Yeah. If you want a real bumba, this was a real bowl. Yeah. yeah. So did you fly all of the fresh ingredients from Vietnam? No. To uh, I I flew back to Vietnam and bought all my plates and bought all my bowls and chopsticks. Oh, Every, okay. Even like the toilet paper holder for the napkins, I bought all that stuff. I really wanted this to be street. For me, I okay. fell in love with street culture in okay. Vietnam, and I wanted to show that to Americans. I wanted to buy, I wanted the stools. I wanted, and in terms of ingredients, there, was, there is a lot of uh, Asian supermarkets in, in Philadelphia, mm. so they flew it from Vietnam and I bought from them. We're at a new market today in District 7. Let's see what they got. In many of his videos, Chad has recounted his experiences visiting Vietnam's traditional markets. Today, Talk Vietnam tagged along with Chad to the local market to buy some fresh ingredients and uncover why Chad enjoys buying groceries at Vietnamese markets so much. Maybe it's wet. We'll go this way. Okay. So, what are we uh, gonna buy today? We're gonna make. We're gonna make something a little special, something okay. a little different, but first we need to get some banh pho. Mm. I'm sure you know about pho already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But, so the flat rice noodle, but I love this lady because she has so many different kinds. They have pretty much every noodle I could think of. Yeah. So all the different kinds of rice noodles, different kinds of wheat noodles, and all kinds of sausages as well. Yeah, but I love pho. I'm sure you love pho. <laughs> I know you love pho. That's why I'm baking it for you. Yeah. But so I wanted to make something that would be somewhat familiar to you, mm -hmm. but just done in a different way, so. Yeah, but why do you uh, go to this place to buy pho? This vendor? Yeah. I go to vendor. the markets because I love it, for one thing. But this vendor, I think she's super nice, so that's why I'm always coming here. And I like getting the pho here because it's nice and fresh. And also all of the noises. It's chaotic. And the I love it. Yeah. And the, when you come to this market, especially in the morning, it's very uh, lively. Yeah. So let me see your bargaining skills. My bargaining skills are terrible. <laughs> My bargaining skills, I pay what they ask me. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jake. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moi hai ngang. Okay, moi hai ngang. It's good for me. I'll tell you okay. Good one, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Alright, so this lady usually has a lot of spices. She'll probably have pepper. Yeah, Any more lang? Yeah, I'm 15 lang. 15 lang? Yeah. So I'm 2 lang. 
familiar to you in flavor. So the pepper will be familiar and delicious, I think. Yeah. Vietnam is uh, famous for, for black pepper. I regret not buying more when I went to Phu Hoc. Okay. I, next time I go to Phu Hoc, I will buy a lot. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You ready? Let's get it. Okay. I like Thio Den. Okay. This is new. I, this is something, a new dish. I have no idea. All right. Thio Den makes sense in my head, but I think uh, the white one could also be okay, and maybe I'll use a little bit of both. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. But we'll get some herbs outside, too. Okay. Are you ready? Let's go. After listening to Chas' sincere exchanges and observing him carefully selecting ingredients for his dishes, we can fully appreciate Chas' efforts to learn new things and his passion for Vietnamese food culture. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about uh, you as a cook sure. in your home. Sure, sure. <laughs> Do you cook at home? All the time. Mm. All the time. Mm. It is my natural instinct to, yeah. to cook, for sure. Mm. When I watched your clip, I saw your kids, yeah. your three kids. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, I, I'm a little bit curious. I didn't see your wife. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So She prefers to be off camera. Uh, okay. Not a big fan of the camera. So, yeah. uh, I always try to respect that. She's mm -hmm. not into it. How is it having a, you know, a chef or a cook in your home? Uh. <laughs> It's hard for me to answer it, <laughs> but I'm sure they love it. <laughs> it's like, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Do I, you guys go to restaurants? All the time. All the time? All the time. Yeah. Um, but if, if I'm cooking, I'm cooking for content. You know, mm. I'm, I'm cooking to film it. It's rare that I'm going to cook something and not film me at this point. Okay. Um, so we kind of go back and forth between me cooking a lot and then eating out a lot. So mm. the last week we've been in an eating out phase. We're eating out all the time. Um, and usually it might be just like I'm edit I have so much to edit. So I'm mm -hmm. editing, I don't have time to cook. All right, let's go get dinner somewhere else. Right, yeah. right. So um, the home cooked meal, yeah. uh, usually at your home, what do you serve? Different every day. Uh -huh. I never cook the same thing. Oh. Um, so which is uh, maybe annoying to some people. Some people want something they've had before or something traditional, but uh, that is not my style. Mm -hmm. I will always cook something new every time. It is very, very rare that I will repeat myself. Mm. For me, cooking is an exploration. So your uh, family members are the first one to, to try the food. Yeah. I'm the first one. I taste it all <laughs> oh, the time. Yes. I taste it yes, yes. 50 times while I'm cooking. But yeah, they, they, they're the first ones to get the end result. Uh, and you also uh, incorporate um, uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, language teaching yeah. also yeah, yeah. <laughs> in your videos. Yeah. I, I found it quite funny. I assume you did. <laughs> <laughs> With the tones yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing is uh, that kind of video is really easy to make, mm -hmm. right? I just put it on and just talk. And then I find out that uh, people enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Vietnam is on its rise. I think Vietnam's going to be the next strong country. So it's cool to help people to start their first um, instincts are first introduction of like, oh, there's a new place in the world I never heard of or don't know anything about, yeah. and uh, to just start getting them into it. Yeah. Well, you know, I think what you are doing is, is very supportive for foreigners who want to have the first exposure to Vietnam yeah. because they can look at it in a very um, casual yeah. and, and fun way. Yeah. 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 Try to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, how do you see yourself? You, you see yourself more as a content creator yeah. or more as a chef? Uh, at this moment, a content creator. Okay. To me, a chef is uh, purely someone who is running a kitchen, who is running a team. Yeah. Um, and are you running a kitchen? No, not now. No. Oh, okay. If I was, I'd be a chef. Right. Um, at this moment, I forever and always, every day, I'm a cook. I will always be a cook my entire life. I can't get, uh, even when I don't want to and I try to run away from that position, I'm always that. It's in my heart. As a chef, there's moments in my life when I'm a chef and there's moments when I'm not. Mm -hmm. Even though most people use that word in a different way than I do, they just think if you're a professional cook, you're a chef. All right, let's go. And we're here. Do you remember this place? Let's go see what the locals do with bitter melon. I got a park purse, though. Returning to Vietnam in 2022, Chad roamed around Ho Chi Minh City and several provinces to visit roadside stalls and release Vietnamese cooking videos on his social media account. Up to now, 
he has cooked almost 700 dishes. For some, Chad sticks to the original recipe, but he also uses his creativity to give some dishes a new twist. The American chef dares to cook challenging dishes such as intestine porridge. He also wants to learn how Vietnamese people make fish sauce, shrimp paste, and sour shrimp and internalize traditional recipes for pho, vermicelli, and mixed glass noodles. Through his compelling video storytelling, Chad has portrayed the rich Vietnamese culinary landscape from a foreign chef's perspective. So looking forward, um, you already have, you know, uh, many, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, followers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. followers. Yeah. Um, what would you want to sell? Uh, I've thought about, in terms of an international audience, mm -hmm. the hard part is the international audience. So I sell merchandise, if you like my shirt. <laughs> I have a lot of shirts. Okay. Um, I also, I, I haven't done it yet just because I've been busy, but I'd like to put together like a box, like a Vietnam box, like things that I like from Vietnam, mm -hmm. and then I could easily sell that to, to uh, international audience. Yeah. So it'd be like, there's a lot of rice paper here right. that you can't find outside. I don't know why. There must be a reason why, but I don't know the reason. So there's a lot of rice paper that I think is super interesting. Mm -hmm. So I could put, to, put together a box of like, these are the rice papers I really like, here's some candies I really like, there's, there's a fish sauce I really think is good, some amaruk or whatever. The, when I go to the market, here's the stuff I buy, here's your box, here right, you go. Right. That's one aspect. A lot of your uh, viewers yeah. um, are surprisingly uh, Vietnamese overseas, yes, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So when you first started with all of this content creation, yeah. um, your initial purpose was to share, yeah. right, um, your knowledge to other young cook. Yes. But then, but then, yes. uh, you didn't expect that. Uh, you know, it turned out a I, little bit different. I did not expect Vietnamese people to be watching a white guy talk about Vietnamese food. Right. So yes. tell me more about that. Maybe you received uh, comments or messages from a lot. them. I received so. a lot of comments. It's very interesting. Yeah. So overseas Vietnamese or Viet Q, they, a lot of them, um, they just, they feel nostalgic. Mm -hmm. um, so they appreciate the way I'm presenting it and they feel, they just miss home. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the second generation of Vietnamese that have never lived in Vietnam or never experienced it, some of them don't speak Vietnamese well. They just feel lost sometimes or they don't speak the language well enough to be able to understand. Mm -hmm. So I offer them a level of, a level of comfort to to the culture with no judgment from mm -hmm. a foreigner. And right. for some reason, they respond to that well, or they find it easy to absorb the information through my perspective. I see. Yeah, which is, you know, I, I never expected that to happen, but that is very cool, mm -hmm. very, very exciting. If, if I could organize something where I could take like 10 people out uh, to see the country of, of second, second generation Vietnamese who have never been to Vietnam before, mm -hmm. and to give them their first exploration of the country in a very comfortable way where they mm -hmm. don't feel judged, uh, that would be really cool. That's mm -hmm. a big project. I don't know if I could ever do that, but that would just be a really cool thing to offer to people. Yeah. And isn't it fun? Isn't it interesting that uh, you are as a, you know, white and yeah. uh, Westerner yeah. acting as a bridge? Yeah. It's so cool. Connecting, you know. It's so cool. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I really, I didn't expect it. Um, I really, I, th I, thought I, was, I thought I was talking to cooks. I wanted to teach the cooks about using rice flour or tapioca flour and how that <laughs> texture feels and you could implement that in your cuisine yeah. and we haven't gotten to that point yet. Maybe eventually we'll get there, <laughs> but not yet. Yeah, but well, life is full of yeah. surprises. Yeah, and this and is great. This, this is even more emotionally powerful right. than just teaching a technique. Yeah. It's way cooler. Yeah. yeah. So do you think you are on the right track, right path right now? I'm 100% confident uh, in that. 100%. 100% confident, yes. Mm -hmm. There's no other direction for me right now and I think my whole life I've been fighting this direction and uh, to finally be in it and know that this is the, I don't know where it's leading, right. but I know this is the path. Right. The Talk Vietnam crew joined Chad wow. Kubanov so as he cooked honored. a special dish based yeah. on his journey into Vietnamese cuisine. So I wanted to make you something that was going to be familiar. Mm -hmm. okay. And I love pho. You know I love me wang already, so I wanted to kind of do something Combining that, so a little bit like pho presents in a meat wang style. Mm -hmm. So first, this oil, you can dump it in the bowl. Okay. Okay, just dump it right just in there. Just dump it, everything? Yeah, everything. Okay. This oil, I fried already with ginger, yeah. cinnamon, star anise, black cardamom, mm -hmm. clove, and then I fried the shallots inside, I okay. fried the garlic inside, I fried the sesame inside, and I fried the chicken skin inside. 
Mi Guang, or Guang style noodle soup, inspired him to create this dish. The pre made ingredients were mixed in a bowl with cooking oil to absorb the spices better. So, how long did it take you to come up with this recipe? 12 minutes. Oh. Yes. Chat shares with us the useful cooking experiences and techniques he has accumulated during many years as a chef. Just it makes it a little crispier mm -hmm. and it removes some of the stronger flavor. Mm. When I do pho in Hanoi, I see often the green onion is very big pieces. Yeah. So I like the texture of that a lot. Yeah. Chat at limes leaves, kumquats, and his special broth. The chicken stock that I made with the gat yeah. So right now this is just chicken, salt, mm -hmm. and uh, there was one burnt onion inside. Okay. For a little bit of deeper flavor. So I'm going to put a little bit of the hot stock inside. Yeah. Chat whisks eggs with chicken sauce, and this combination will be the game changer for the dish. He sets the bowl of egg mixture over a pot of simmering water. He starts whisking it until the sauce thickens. After that, he puts sliced lemon leaves and kumquat juice into the bowl yeah. mm. and mixes it well. He adds a sprinkling of sugar and salt and then stirs. Shredded chicken is added to the sauce before adding onion and coriander on top. Zao. Zao zao? Yeah. And you throw some fish sauce in? Maybe sauce. like... How many Three spoons? Three of those spoons. You want to mix it? Yeah. Prong Don't know. Finally, he pours the egg sauce into the bowl of noodles. So you see that kind of envelops it. So I wanted to get the color, but I didn't want it to be too crazy spicy, so I used a little bell pepper. Mm, yeah. A little bit of cilantro. Yeah. Done. Oh. Samurai. Do you have a name for this new dish? <laughs> well, I guess it would be pho ga trong so chung. Mm. Is that alright? Pho ga trong so chung. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so now let me try. Yeah, let me see. I'm curious if you like this. Yeah. Mmm. I like it. You like it? Mm hmm. The egg really changes the texture of the soup. Exactly. It makes mm. it very different. Mm hmm. Even though the flavor is very. Vietnamese in a way, the yeah. texture all of a sudden is like, wow, what's going on here? Something's I agree. creamy. Creamy? Yeah, there's a creaminess. Rich. Yeah. But yeah. it still has the um, chicken. Yeah. And um, sweet and sour. Mm. Mm -hmm. So to be able to kind of imagine or yeah. visualize how things go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can totally put things together in my head and imagine the taste of the texture and, and hopefully predict a good yeah. outcome. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Sweet treat. I want to go back to, uh, to your statement uh, sure. in the beginning. Uh, in Vietnam, you found yourself a better cook. For sure. Uh, explain it to me now. Uh, there's a lot of techniques. So there's a lot of, not a lot of new techniques. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new flavors. So the more you experience, the, the more perspectives, the more angles you have to view something through. So it makes me, a, for sure, a better cook. Um, in Vietnam, specifically flavor-wise and Flavor-wise, it's taught me about balance. It's taught me about texture, and texture meaning uh, chewy. We don't mm -hmm. have chewy in the West. We have chewy here. Chewy is an important texture. Bitter, I didn't appreciate bitter before. I love bitter now. So mm. now that I, I have an appreciation for chewy, so when I do a Western dish, I can think about chewy. How do mm -hmm. I implement chewy? Okay. How would chewy be valuable here? How do I implement bitter? How do I implement tannic? Would that be a valuable thing in this situation? Mm -hmm. When I have Western, we don't have strong balance with fried things. So if in the West I have a fried dish, how do I implement a pickle? How do I implement something fresh? Can I wrap it? Can I add mm -hmm. herbs to it? How do I bring this? It's too heavy. How do I make it lighter? Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in the same way for Vietnamese cuisine, it's like, okay, this is super light. How do I deepen it a little bit? It's mm -hmm. like, how can I make it a little bit darker? How can I implement a little bit more creaminess? How can I add some fattiness to it? Um, so, you know, you're trying to grab techniques from both and just push them together. Not push them, but let them blend together in a way. Yeah, yeah which is not easy. It's very mm -hmm. hard to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, um, through your sharing, yeah. um, through what you are doing, yeah. I think you are selling Vietnamese culture, which is in a way. good, yeah, yes, in a way. Yes. because uh, with that, uh, you have spread yeah. uh, the value uh, of Vietnamese culture. Yeah. 
to the world. Yeah. How should we keep, promote this and, and, and improve it in a you know, better way to... I think you just keep going. Keep I don't going. know if there's a specific thing. Like I, I, in my view, Vietnam is the next place. You know, it's like Japan, Korea, and now Vietnam's the next place. Mm. Um, it's, it's on its way, and I think it will, in 10 years, it'll be very strong. So the, the, the food is an easy way to bring people in because mm. uh, most people like it. It's not hard to like it. It's, an, it's a very easy cuisine to enjoy. There's a few things that might be pushy for people, but most things are pretty simple for people to enjoy, so that's a really easy thing. So in terms of um, business yeah. uh, and acceptance of uh, the industry, yeah. um, do you think that it's, it's easy to do business here? And in terms of opening a business, yes. It's so much easier. And that was a big lesson I had in America. I love Ho Chi Minh City in the morning because you see all these vendors pop up that only sell for an hour or two hours. And they might just sell, they just have a little cooler of sticky rice. Mm. And they just open up, they sell 30 portions, they make whatever, 500,000 that day or 300,000 that day, but they, they do it. So the, the, the entrepreneurial spirit of uh, the city and this country is so cool that people can just open businesses immediately. They can try, they can fail. Mm. They can try again, they can fail. Mm. In America, it starts, you have to put out so much money to try. And then when you fail, it's brutal. Chào cô. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want shrimp or no shrimp? Mà một tô không thịt và hai tô thịt. Mì quảng đúng rồi, đúng rồi. Yeah. Và thêm một mì quảng tập cám. Dạ cảm ơn cô. Dạ. Dạ cảm ơn cô. Chắc đi đến đây là khoảng bốn năm lần. Mỗi lần anh tới anh ăn là rất là thích ăn mì quảng. À, anh nói tiếng Việt rất rành. Anh nói là cho một tô mì quảng đi có bánh đa nữa. Điều mà tôi rất vui là vì à, thường là anh hay tới một mình nhưng hôm nay thì đem cả gia đình tới ăn rất là vui. Không chỉ người Việt á, là thích ăn món ăn ở đây à, mì quảng và bún bò mà cả người nước ngoài cũng rất là thích ăn. You want lime tree? You want cracker inside? This is a new spot for us. This is in District 7, very close to our house. It's one of my favorite new places. This is the first time I brought my kids here, though. I think it's the best Mi Wang in District 7, at least to me right now. The flavor's great. It has a strong chicken flavor, a lot of shrimp in here, too. I've been here about three times now, and it's definitely becoming a new favorite. Traveling around Ho Chi Minh City, savoring delicious food, learning about the local cuisine, and innovating unique dishes are pursuits <laughs> that Chad Kubinov always wants to do to satisfy his passion. In so doing, he has shown his affection and special bond with Vietnam. So Chad, what do you think uh, make Vietnamese street food so different from other countries? Um, I think any this region of the world, Southeast Asia specifically, uh, they don't, we don't have to deal with winter. We don't have to deal with severe winter. So it allows, like if I have a restaurant in Japan or even in parts of America, I always have to think about winter. So I can't build my restaurant around uh, so open air. I mm -hmm. have to be, I have to factor that in and think about the heating element, think about uh, just the design of the restaurant itself. But here I never have to deal with winter. So the idea that we can have all these open air restaurants or we can have a restaurant that's just a cart and just has chairs, you know, you just pop them out is so yeah. exciting and makes it so, much more flexible and so much more consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is one element that this region of the world has a strong advantage in terms of building an incredible street food and a street culture. And beyond that, I think Vietnam specifically, because it's motorbike dominated, mm -hmm. it's just perfect for street food. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for street culture, it's perfect. One, because we don't have to deal with so much parking. Mm -hmm. So things are very flexible in terms of parking. You can, you can have a very small restaurant and still serve a lot of people. Yeah. And, and you can just, if you see something you like, you just turn around, right. no big deal. Right. Let me go try that thing, you just turn around. So I think the motorbikes are such a crucial element to keeping or to making the street food so exciting and so unique compared to other countries. Mm -hmm. So yeah. convenience. Is convenience, yeah, convenience is, people don't understand how convenient it is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also how uh, the convenience equals um, uh, casualness mm -hmm. and the casualness is is so wonderful that people don't get that that you could wear anything you could be you could just be in your shorts and sandals and still have an amazing food amazing dish amazing food and you could be sitting next to someone who is 
maybe much more well off and mm. someone who is much less well off and everybody's enjoying the same bowl. Well, I think that's it for our discussion today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all thank of you. the experience and, yeah. and, and um, all of the uh, vivid uh, <laughs> experiments you had with Vietnamese food, Vietnamese cuisine, and Vietnamese culture. Uh, we wish you all the best for your future endeavor. Yeah. And I uh, hope to have you back here. Thank you so much. And share more to Thank our you. audience Very about fun. Vietnamese cuisine. Cool. There is no sincerer love than the love for food. And this is according to the famous Irish writer, Josh Bernard Shaw. For Chad Kubanov, he obviously loves Vietnamese cuisine, Vietnamese street food, Vietnamese culture, and he keeps himself busy creating videos featuring Vietnamese cuisine. So we wish him all the best for his future endeavor. And hopefully he would keep sharing Vietnamese values to viewers all over the world. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Talk Vietnam and we'll see you again next time.